What's up, everybody? Core use buddy history. All right, so as we come to the end of this ZR rifle file, let me see, what exactly is this thing? Uh, it is, um, it's approved drafting subcommittee 10875. Um, Lumumba sections open possible reconsideration. So this is a, I thought it was a 1978 document. Probably is. Um, referring to the 19, it's a 78 document referring to the 75 document. And so this is the conclusion on all the ZR Rifle stuff and whether ZR Rifle was connected to Lumumba and all that other stuff. Of course it was, but it wasn't really, but it kind of was, but you never know. But that's how the CIA operates. Even they don't know what the fuck they're doing. So uh, here we go. Section 4, Findings and Conclusions. In evaluating the evidence and arriving at findings and conclusions, the committee has been guided by the following standards. We believe these standards to be appropriate to the constitutional duty of the Congressional Committee. One, the committee is not a court. The primary role is not to determine individual guilt or innocence, but rather to draw upon the experiences of the past to better propose guidance for the future. Two, it is necessary to be cautious in reaching conclusions because of the amount of time that has passed since the events reviewed in this report. The inability of three presidents and many other key figures to speak for themselves, the conflicting and ambiguous nature of much of the evidence and the problems in assessing the weight to be given to particular documents and testimony. Three, the committee has tried to be fair to the persons involved in the events under examination while at the same time responding to a need to understand the facts in sufficient detail to lay a basis for informed recommendations. With these standards in mind, the committee has arrived at the following findings and conclusions. A. Findings concerning the plots themselves. 1. Officials of the United States government initiated plots to assassinate Fidel Castro and Patrice Lumumba. The committee finds that the officials of the United States government initiated and participated in plots to assassinate Patrice Lumumba and Fidel Castro. The plot to kill Lumumba was conceived in the latter half of 1960 by officials in the United States government and quickly advanced to the point of sending poisons to the Congo to be used for the assassination. The effort to assassinate Castro began in 1960 and continued until 1965. The plans to assassinate Castro using poison cigars, exploding seashells, and a contaminated diving suit did not advance beyond the laboratory phase. The plot involving underworld figures reached the stage of producing poison pills, establishing the contacts necessary to send them into Cuba, procuring potential assassins within Cuba, and, according to witness, delivering the pills to the island itself. In the 1960 plot involving a Cuban pilot in the Amlash episode from 63 to 65, the CIA gave active support and encouragement to Cubans whose intent was to assassinate Castro was known and provided the means for carrying out the assassination. Okay, let me pause as we read this conclusion. I don't buy this for a motherfucking second. I believe perhaps there were some plots to kill Castro in 1960 and then maybe 1961, but I don't believe there were any active plots that were meant to actually do anything than be distraction distractionary, like this exploding cigar and the poison pills and all this stuff and the stuff involving the mafia and like, I don't believe any of that was meant to actually come to fruition. It was all think tank stuff. It was all on paper. It was all theoretical. I don't believe that it was ever intended to opt to work because you can't just kill Castro with a fucking cigar and expect the entire regime to fall. Who took over after Castro uh, stepped down? His brother Raul Castro. It's exactly what would have happened in 19 fucking 63. Like, am I the only one? Am I stupid? Am I the only one who fucking thinks this way? Does, is the government a bunch of fucking retards? No, they're not. They know exactly what the fuck time it is. They know that taking out Castro ain't going to change nothing. Raul Castro will be put in place and that's it. Done with. Over with. Back to square one. So I don't want to hear fucking nothing about taking out Castro. It is a fucking red herring. It's the get you to look to the left while they're doing something to the right. And to me, like the... Proof in the pudding was the fact that if you dig into the covert activities between the Cubans and the, um, and the Israelis and the Americans, it becomes obvious that the Cubans were partnered with the Israelis through 1967 to do covert ops. I don't know what kind of covert ops, but it was sold to the public as, an, uh, as, a, um, 
a relations organization or multiple relations organizations, right? I talk about this in my seven hour um, presentation. And then you have the CIA working with the fucking Israelis all through or forever, right? So uh, the idea that between, you know, 60 and 67, that the Cubans were not at least acknowledged to have been partnered with the Mossad and the kibbutz movement uh, by the CIA is fucking ridiculous. Give me a break. It's stupid. There's articles written about it. It's dumb. Okay. So of course they fucking knew. And so the idea that Cubans were ever a target, like a, a serious target after the Bay of Pigs. Um, and to some degree, I just don't buy the Bay of Pigs story. It seems ridiculous on its face. Almost like it was designed to fail. <sighs> Hopefully one day I'll have time to get to that. But I just don't buy it. Something about it. My, my bullshit detector is just going off. Really? The Bay of Pigs? They thought they, they were going to overthrow Castro with the Bay of Pigs? Really? Really? I don't know. Had to have been something else going on there. But see, yeah, I don't buy any of these fucking assassination attempts against Castro that they were real. Like, we took over a fucking Iraq in a day, but we couldn't knock over a fucking two-bit dictator on a fucking island 90 miles off our coast. Like, it just doesn't make any sense at all. It's ridiculous. Um, two, no foreign leaders were killed as a result of assassination plots initiated by officials of the United States. Yeah, that's bullshit cover-up. We already know why. Go back and listen to the last couple episodes about how they supplied all the weapons and all this stuff, and then at the last minute, they deny responsibility. It's nonsense. The poisons intended for use against Patrice Lumumba were never administered to him. That's true. And there was no evidence that the United States was in any way involved in Lumumba's death. That's false. At the hands of his Congolese enemies. The effort to assassinate Castro failed. Um, three, American officials encouraged or were privy to coup plots, which resulted in the death of Trujillo, DM, and Snyder. Okay, well, this is getting a little bit more honest, right? American officials clearly desired the overthrow of the Trujillo of Trujillo offered both encouragement and guns to local dissidents attempting to overthrow and supplied them with pistols and rifles. Then they kill them, but with different pistols and rifles. And therefore the American government's not responsible. Like, are you fucking kidding me? Okay. For the, for the, for this case, you can think of the rifles and the handguns as fungible. American officials offered encouragement to the Vietnamese generals who plotted DM's overthrow, and a CIA official in Vietnam gave the generals money after the coup had begun. However, DM's assassination was neither desired nor suggested by the officials of the United States. Bullshit. The record reveals that the United States uh, officials offered encouragement to the Chilean dissidents who plotted the kidnapping of General Rene Schneider, but did not desire or encourage his death. Certain high officials did know that the dissidents planned to kidnap General Schneider. As Director Colby testified before the committee, the death of a foreign leader is a risk foreseeable in any coup attempt. In the cases we have considered, the risk of death was known in varying degrees. It was widely known that the dissidents in the Dominican Republic intended to assassinate Trujillo. The contemplation of coup leaders to assassinate New, President Diem's brother, was communicated to the upper levels of the United States government while the CIA and perhaps the White House knew that the coup leaders in Chile planned to kidnap General Schneider. It was not anticipated. Uh, that he would be killed, although the possibility of his death should have been recognized as a foreseeable risk of his kidnapping. Um, four, the plots occurred in a Cold War atmosphere perceived to be of crisis proportions. The committee fully appreciates the importance of evaluating the assassination plots in the historical context with, which, within which they occurred. In the preface to this report, we described the perception generally shared within the United States during the depth of the Cold War that the country faced a monolithic enemy in communism. That attitude helps explain the assassination plots, which we have reviewed, although it does not justify them. Uh, those involved nevertheless appeared to believe they were advancing the best interests in their country. Oh my god, my fucking scroll is having a delay in it. What the fuck is going on, computer? Okay, five American officials had exaggerated notions about their ability to control the actions of coup leaders. Running throughout the cases considered in this report was the expectation of American officials that they could control the actions of dissident groups, which they were supporting in foreign countries. Events demonstrated that the United States had no such power. This point is graphically demonstrated by cables exchanged shortly before the coup in Vietnam 
Ambassador Lodge cabled Washington on October 30th, 1963, that he was unable to halt a coup. A cable from Bundy in response stated that, quote, we cannot accept conclusion that we have no power to delay or discourage a coup. The coup took place three days later. Shortly after the experience of the Bay of Pigs, CIA headquarters requested operatives in the Dominican Republic to tell uh, the dissidents to turn off the assassination attempt because the United States was not prepared to cope with the aftermath. The dissidents replied that the assassination was their affair and that it could not be turned off to suit the convenience of the United States government. Six, CIA officials made use of known underworld figures in assassination efforts. Officials of the CIA made use of persons associated with the criminal underworld in attempting to achieve the assassination of Fidel Castro. These underworld figures were relied upon because it was believed that they had expertise and contacts which were not available to law-abiding citizens. Foreign citizens with criminal backgrounds were also used by the CIA in two other cases that we have reviewed. In the development of the executive action capability, one foreign national with a criminal background was used to spot other members of the European underworld who might be used by the CIA for a variety of purposes, including assassination if assassination if the need should arise. So he's talking about uh, Jean-Pierre Lafitte. Uh, in the Lumumba case, two men with criminal backgrounds were used as field operatives by CIA officers in a volatile political situation in the Congo. B. Conclusions concerning the plots themselves. 1. The United States should not engage in assassination. We cannot condone the use of assassination as a tool of foreign policy. Aside from pragmatic arguments against the use of assassination supplied to the committee by witnesses with extensive experience in covert operations, we find that assassination violates moral precepts fundamental to our way of life. In addition to considerations, there were several practical reasons advanced for not assassinating foreign leaders. These reasons are discussed in the section of this report commencing, uh, or I'm sorry, recommending a statute making assassination a crime. A. Distinction between targeted assassinations instigated by the United States and support for dissidents seeking to overthrow local governments. Man, that's splitting hairs, isn't it? Two of the five principal cases investigated by the committee involved plots to kill foreign leaders, Lumumba and Castro, that were instigated by American officials. Uh, three of the cases, Trujillo, Diem, Schneider, involved killings in the course of coup attempts by local dissidents. These latter cases differed to the degree which assassination was contemplated by the leaders of coup and the degree to which United States officials motivated the coups. They, the committee concludes that the targeted assassinations instigated by the United States must be prohibited. Coups involve varying degrees of risk by, of assassination. The possibility of assassination in coup attempts raises questions concerning the proprietary, the property, I'm sorry, what word is that? Propriety of United States involvement in coups, particularly in those where assassination of a foreign leader is likely prospect. This country was created by violent revolution against a regime believed to be tyrannous, and our founding fathers, the local dissidents of the area, uh, received aid from foreign countries. Uh, given that history, we should not today rule out support for dissident groups seeking to overthrow tyrants. But passing beyond that principle, there remain serious questions. For example, whether the national interest of the United States is genuinely involved, whether any such support should be overt rather than covert, what tactics should be used, and how such actions should be authorized and controlled by the coordinate branches of government. The committee believes that its recommendation on the question of covert action in, in support of coups must await the committee's final report, which will be issued after a full review of covert action in general. B. The setting in which the assassination plots occurred explains but does not justify them. The Cold War setting in which the assassination plots took place does not change our view that assassination is unacceptable in our society. In addition to the moral and practical problems discussed elsewhere, we find two principal defects in any contention that the tenor of the, per of the period justified the assassination plots. First, the assassination plots were not necess necessitated by imminent danger to the United States. Among the cases studied, Castro alone posed a threat to the United States, but then only during a period of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Castro's assassination had been planned by the CIA long before that crisis and was not advanced by policymakers as a possible course of action during the crisis. Second, we reject absolutely any notion that the United States should justify its actions by the standards of totalitarians. Our standards must be higher, and this difference is what the struggle is all about. 
Of course, we must defend our democracy, but in defending it, we must resist undermining the very virtues we are defending. Well, it seems we've abandoned that concept, haven't we? Two documents which have been supplied to the committee graphically demonstrate attitudes which can lead to tactics that erode and could ultimately destroy the very ideals we must defend. The first was written in 1954 by a special committee formed to advise the president on covert activities. The United States may, it said, have to adopt tactics, quote, more ruthless than those employed by the enemy in order to meet the threat from hostile nations. The report concluded that, quote, long-standing American concepts of American fair play must be reconsidered. Although those proposals did not involve assassinations, the attitude underlying them were, as Director Colby testified, indicative of the setting within which the assassination plots were conceived. Colby Testimony, 6475, page 117. We have a lengthy asterisk here. It says the full text of the passage is as follows. Another important requirement is an aggressive, covert, psychological, political, and paramilitary organization far more effective, more unique, and if necessary, more ruthless than that employed by the enemy. No one should be permitted to stand in the way of the prompt, efficient, and secure accomplishment of this mission. The second consideration it is now clear that we are facing an implacable enemy whose avowed objective is world domination by whatever means at whatever cost. There are no rules in such a game. Hitherto, acceptable norms of human conduct do not apply. If the U.S. is to survive, long-standing American concepts of American fair play must be reconsidered. Ah, now there's the Hitler ideology that I see. And the criticism that I have of Hitler, if you're following my other podcast on Substack, as we're talking our way through Mein Kampf. So this was very much along the lines that Hitler thought. It was very clear and decisive. uh, And that if you know that the enemy is going to be ruthless, you have to be ruthless as well. And it wasn't even like an option. It was mandatory, right? And therefore you had to base your policy around this ruthlessness. And uh, I don't know if I agree with that completely. I genuinely don't. Like today, in today's day and age, are the Russians uh, ruthlessly spying on us in an attempt to take over the fucking world? No, <laughs> no. not even remotely fucking close. No, the only pe- the, the only people in the world that applies to are the Israelis. Um, so yeah, so this uh, this criticism I would have here of this government policy would kind of coincide with the criticisms I have of Hitler's uh, absolute stoicism. All right, moving on. We do not think that traditional American notions of fair play need to be abandoned when dealing with our adversaries. It may well be ourselves that we injure most if we adopt tactics, quote, more ruthless than the enemy. And that's exactly the case, isn't it? A second document which represents an attitude which we find improper was sent to the Congo in the fall of 1960 when the assassination of Patrice Lumumba was being considered. The chief of CIA's Africa division recommended a particular agent, W.I. Rogue, because... Quote, he is intended, oh, I'm sorry, he is indeed aware of the precepts of right and wrong, but if he is given an assignment, which may be morally wrong in the eyes of the world, but necessary because his case officer ordered him to carry out, then it is right, and he will dutifully undertake appropriate action for its execution without the pangs of conscience. In a word, he can rationalize all actions. The committee finds this philosophy is not in keeping with the ideals of our nation. Two, the United States should not make use of underworld figures for their criminal talents. <laughs> you think? We conclude that agencies of the United States must not use underworld figures for their criminal talents in carrying out their operations. In addition to the corrosive effect uh, upon our government, the use of underworld figures involves the following dangers. And before I get to that, let me read this asterisk. Pending our investigation of the use of informants by the FBI and other agencies, we reserve judgment on the use of known criminals as informants. We are concerned here only with the use of persons known to be actively engaged in criminal pursuits for their expertise in carrying out criminal acts. All right, so those dangers are the use of underworld figures for dirty business gives them the power to blackmail the government and to avoid prosecution for past or future crimes. For example, the figures involved in the Castro assassination operation used their involvement with the CIA to avoid prosecution. The CIA also contemplated attempting to quash criminal charges against QJ Wynn in a foreign tribunal. <laughs> oh, that's fucking hilarious. B, the use of persons experienced in criminal techniques and prone to criminal behavior increases the likelihood that criminal acts will occur. 
Agents in the field are necessarily given broad discretion, but the risk of improper activities is increased when persons of criminal background are used, particularly when they are selected precisely to take advantage of their criminal skills or contacts. We have another asterisk here. The corrosive effect of dealing with underworld figures is graphically demonstrated by the fact that Attorney General Robert Kennedy, who had devoted much of his professional life to fighting organized crime, did not issue an order against cooperating with such persons when he learned in May 61 that the CIA had made use of Sam Giancana in a sensitive operation in Cuba. In May of 1962, when the Attorney General learned that the operation had involved assassination, he did, according to CIA witness, inform these those briefing him that underworld figures should not be used before checking with him first, but failed to direct that they must never be uh, used. All right, next, uh, there is a danger that the United States government will become an unwitting accomplice to criminal acts and that criminal figures will take advantage of their association with the government to advance their own projects and interests. And D, there is a fundamental impropriety in selecting persons because they are skilled at performing deeds which the laws of our society forbid. The use of underworld figures by the United States government for their criminal skills raises moral problems comparable to those recognized by Justice uh, Brandes in a uh, different context five, days, five decades ago. Quote, our government is the potent and omnipresent teacher. For good or ill, it teaches the whole people by its example. Crime is contagious. The government becomes a lawbreaker. It breeds contempt for law. It invites every man to become a law unto himself. To declare that in the administration of the criminal law, in the end justifies the means to declare that the government may commit crimes in order to secure the conviction of a private criminal would bring terrible retribution against the pernicious doctrine this court should resolutely set its face. Olmstead versus the United States, 277. Uh, U.S. Code 439. Let me take a screenshot of that for my own personal reference. C. Findings and conclusions relating to the issues of authorization and control. In the introduction of this report, we set forth in summary our major conclusions concerning whether the assassination plots were authorized. The ensuing discussion elaborates and explains those conclusions. The committee analyzed the questions of authorization for the assassination activities from two perspectives. First, the committee examined whether officials in policymaking positions authorized or were aware of the assassination activities. Second, the committee inquired whether the officials responsible for the operational details of the plots perceived that assassination had the approval of their superiors, or at least was the type of activity that the superiors would not disapprove. No doubt the CIA's general efforts against the regimes discussed in this report were authorized at the highest levels of government, but the record leaves serious doubt concerning whether assassination was authorized by the administrations. Even if the plots were not expressly authorized, it does not follow that the agency personnel believed they were acting improperly. Uh, one, command for the control, command and control system for assassination was such that the plots could have been undertaken without express authorization. As emphasized throughout this report, we are unable to draw firm conclusions concerning responsibility for the assassination plots. Even after our long investigation, it is unclear whether the conflicting and inconclusive state of the evidence is due to the system of plausible denial and its attendant doctrines, or whether there were, in fact, serious shortcomings in the system of authorization which made it possible for assassination efforts to have been undertaken by agencies of the United States government without express authority from officials outside of those agencies. Give me a fucking break. We don't know if the CIA is playing us as per their policy of playing us, or if they're actually incompetent or not. Derp. derp a derp me a fucking break. Our preeminent finding is that the assassination could have been undertaken by an agency of the United States government without its having been uncontrovertibly clear that there was explicit authorization from the highest level. The command and control system revealed by the record made it possible for the CIA to have engaged in assassination activities without express authorization by officials outside the agency. The ambiguity and imprecision in the record illustrates the dangers of a plausible denial system in which the precise level of authorization may be difficult to ascertain. While there is no evidence that the plausible denial system has succeeded in shielding decision makers in the cases considered in this report, the possibility that a system exists which might permit those responsible for authorizing major operations to escape responsibility is disturbing. Responsible government requires that public officials be held accountable for their decisions. 
2. Findings relating to the level at which the plots were authorized. A. DM. We find that neither the president nor any other official United States government authorized the assassination of DM and his brother New. Both the DCI and top State Department officials did know, however, that the death of New, at least at one point, had been contemplated by the coup leaders. To the contrary, when the possibility that the coup leaders were considering assassination was brought to the attention of the DCI, he directed that the United States would have no part in such activity, and this information was relayed to the coup leaders. B. Schneider. We find that neither the president nor any other official in the United States government authorized the assassination of General Rene Schneider. The CIA and perhaps the White House did know that coup leaders contemplated kidnapping, which, as it turned out, resulted in Schneider's death. All right, let me just pause right here. So let's re- let's talk about the case of Schneider again real quick, because I'm going to make a point here. So Schneider um, was a constitutionally minded general who stood in the way of coup attempts. Right, he would he would not allow a coup. He couldn't. They they came. To, the CIA came to the realization that there could not be a coup if Schneider was still in place. Okay, they discussed this with the coup plotters. Then, um, the coup plotters end up kidnapping and killing Schneider, and then the CIA is like, "Whoa, we might have been plotting with you." To, to to kill him, but not in this manner, and we didn't give the green light or go ahead, none of the stuff, right? Okay, so let's just say that you or I had plotted with somebody to kidnap and kill somebody, okay? And we have people on the inside who are going to kidnap this person we, we don't like. And they go and they end up uh, kidnapping and then they end up killing him. Then they name us, we get caught, we go to fucking jail, and then they say, well, what happened? They're like, well, we plotted with them. Um, we gave them the weapons. We gave them a rifle and some handguns. We plotted to kill them, but uh, we didn't give them a green light. And then they, we don't even know if they used the weapons that we gave them to kill them. So therefore, we had nothing to do with it. Are you fucking kidding? If it was you or me, we'd spend the rest of our lives in a fucking prison cell. If not worse. But the fucking CIA does it, and it's, oh, we didn't, we didn't know. Like, fuck this government. All right, and Trujillo is the worst, because they don't even know if they used the rifles and, and the handguns that they had given them. C. Trujillo, the presidents and other senior officials in the Eisenhower and Kennedy administration sought to overthrow of Trujillo and approve general action to obtain that end. The DCI and the Assistant Secretary of State for Inter-American Affairs knew that the Dominican dissidents intended to assassinate Trujillo, but the date at which the dissidents' intent to assassinate was communicated to higher levels of the government responsible for formulating policy is less clear. The record does establish that in the spring of 1961, senior American officials, including the president, learned that the dissidents intended to assassinate Trujillo and that they desired machine guns for that purpose. The special group disapproved uh, passage of those weapons, and the president himself in a telegram reaffirmed that decision, indicating that the United States, quote, as a matter of general policy, cannot condone assassination, end quote, although he did state that if the coup succeeded, the United States would support the plotters. But what they don't mention here in the summary is that the weapons did end up getting passed, and everyone was like, oh, we don't know how the weapons got passed. We didn't do it. All right, D. Lumumba. The chain of events revealed by the documents and testimony is strong enough to permit A reasonable inference that the assassination plot was authorized by the president. It is absolutely clear that Alan Dulles Dulles authorized the plot. The juxtaposition of discussions concerning disposing of Lumumba and taking straightforward action against him at NSC, uh, the special group meetings with Dulles cable to the Congo, Bissell's representation to Gottlieb about highest authority and the delivery of poison to the Congo can be read to support an inference that that the president and the special group urged the assassination of Lumumba. Robert Johnson's testimony that he understood the president to have ordered Lumumba's assassination at an NSC meeting does, as he said, offer a clue, in quotes, about presidential authorization, which, however, should be read in light of uncertain record of the meetings of Johnson attended and the contrary testimony of others in attendance at the meetings, including the president's national security advisors. The fact that both the chief of station and Gottlieb were under the impression that there was presidential authorization for the assassination of Lumumba is not in itself direct evidence of such authorization because this impression was derived solely from Gottlieb's meetings with Bissell and Tweedy. Neither Gottlieb nor the chief of station had firsthand knowledge of Alan Dulles' statements about presidential authorization. Richard Bissell assumed that such authorization had been conveyed to him by Dulles, but Bissell had no specific recollection of 
any event when this occurred. The evidence leads us to conclude that DDP Bissell and DCI Dulles knew about and authorized the plot to assassinate Lumumba. However, we are unable to make a finding that President Eisenhower intentionally authorized an assassination effort against Lumumba because of the lack of absolute certainty in the evidence. E. Castro, there was no evidence from which the committee could conclude that the presidents, Eisenhower, Kennedy, or Johnson, their close advisors, or the special group authorized the assassination of Castro. We find the effort of, uh, against Castro was clearly authorized through the level of DDP. It is not certain whether Alan Dulles knew about these plots, although Bissell and Edwards were of the opinion that he did, and the credibility of their beliefs is buttressed by the fact that Dulles knew about the Lumumba assassination plot, which was planned and attempted at the time of the early Castro plots. We can find no evidence that McCone was aware of the plots which occurred during his tenure. His DDP, Richard Helms, testified that he never discussed the subject with McCone and was never expressly authorized by anyone to assassinate Castro. The only suggestion of express presidential authorization for the plots against Castro was Richard Bissell's opinion that Dulles would have circumlocutiously informed Presidents Eisenhower and Kennedy after the assassination had been planned and was underway. The assumptions underlying this opinion are too attenuated for the committee to adopt it as a finding. First, it assumes that Dulles himself knew of the plots, a matter which is not certain. Second, it assumes that Dulles went privately to the two presidents of a course of action which Helms, who had far more covert action experience than Bissell testified, was precisely what the doctrine of plausible denial forbade CIA officials from doing. Third, it necessarily assumes that the presidents would understand from a circumlocutious description that the assassination was being discussed. The chain of assumptions is far too speculative for the committee to make findings implicating the presidents who were not able to speak for themselves Moreover, it is inconsistent with Bissell's other testimony that formal and explicit approval would be required for assassination, and contrary to the testimony of all the presidential advisors, the men closest to both Eisenhower and Kennedy. We have an asterisk here. If the evidence concerning President Eisenhower's order to assassinate Lumumba is correct, it should be weighed against Bissell's testimony concerning circumlocutious briefings of the presidents in the Castro case. First, the Lumumba case would imply that President Eisenhower and Dulles did discuss such matters bluntly and not circumlocutiously. Second, the Lumumba example indicates that the president would discuss such matters openly in an appropriate forum and would not need to be approached privately. Third, it can be inferred from Bissell's testimony in the Castro case that if President Eisenhower had told Dulles that he approved of the plot, Dulles would not have told anyone else of that fact. Yet Gottlieb's testimony in the Lumumba case states that he had been told of presidential authorization for assassination by Bissell, who in turn assumed he was told by Dulles. Helms and McCone testified that the presidents under which they served never asked them to consider assassination. There was no evidence whatsoever that President Johnson knew about or authorized any assassination activity during his presidency. Uh, three, CIA officials involved in the assassination operations perceived assassination to have been a permissible course of action. The CIA officials involved in targeted assassination attempts testified that they had believed that their activities had been fully authorized. Now, that's going to have an upcoming asterisk. In the case of the Lumumba assassination operation, Richard Bissell testified that he had no direct recollection or authorization, but after having reviewed the cables in special group minutes, testified that authority must have flowed from Dulles through him to the subordinate levels in the agency. In the case of the assassination effort against Castro, Bissell and Sheffield Edwards testified they believed the operation involving underworld figures had been authorized by Dulles when they briefed him shortly after the plot had been initiated. William Harvey testified he believed that the plots, quote, were completely authorized at every appropriate level within the agency and beyond. Uh, although he had no personal knowledge, whatever of the individual's identities and times, exact words or channels through which such authority may have passed, Harvey stated that he may have uh, he had been told by Richard Bissell that the effort against Castro had been authorized, quote, from the highest level and that Harvey had discussed the plots with Richard Helms, his immediate supervisor. Helms testified that although he had never discussed assassination with his superiors, he believed that, quote, that in these actions we were taking against Cuba and against Fidel Castro's government in Cuba, that they were what we had been asked to do. In other words, we had been asked to get rid of Castro and there were no limitations put on the means. And we felt we were acting well within the guidelines that we understood to be in play at this particular time. 
The evidence points to a disturbing situation. Agency officials perceived the effort to assassinate Castro to have been within the parameters of permissible action, but administration officials, including McCone, responsible for formulating policy, were not aware of the effort and did not authorize it. The explanation may lie in the fact that orders concerning overthrow of the Castro regime were stated in broad terms that were subject to differing interpretations by those responsible for carrying out those orders. The various presidents and their senior advisors strongly opposed the regimes of Castro and Trujillo, the extension to power of Allende, and the political influence of Patrice Lumumba. Orders concerning action against those foreign leaders were given in vigorous language. For example, President Nixon's order to prevent Allende from assuming power left Helms feeling that, quote, if I ever carried a marshal's baton in my knapsack out of the Oval Office, it was that day. Similarly, General Lansdale described the mongoose effort against Cuba as, quote, a combat situation. And Attorney General Kennedy emphasized that, quote, a solution to the Cuban problem today carries top priority. Helms testified that the pressure to get rid of Castro and the Castro regime was intense. And Bissell testified that he had been ordered to, quote, get off your ass about Cuba. It is possible that there was a failure of communication between policymakers and the agency personnel who were experienced in secret and often violent action. Although policymakers testified that assassination was not intended by such words as get rid of Castro, some of their subordinates in the agency testified that they perceived that assassination was desired and that they should proceed without troubling their supervisors. Ah, what's a pesky little matter like assassination to bother my superior over? The 1967 Inspector General's Report on Assassinations appropriately observed, quote, the point of this, that of frequent resort of Sign, what the fuck word is this? S-Y-N-E-C-H-D-O-C-H-E. The mention of a part of when the whole is to be understood or vice versa. Thus, we encounter repeated references to the phrases such as disposing of Castro, which may be read in the narrow literal sense of assassinating him when it is intended that it be read in the broader figurative sense of dislodging the Castro regime. Reversing the coin, we find people speaking vaguely of, quote, doing something about Castro when it is clear what they are specifically in mind is killing him in a situation wherein those speaking may not have actually meant what they uh, seem to say or may not have said what they actually meant. They should be not be surprised if their oral shorthand is interpreted differently than was intended. Differing perceptions between superiors and their subordinates were graphically illustrated in the Castro context. McCone, in a memorandum dated April 14, 67, reflected as follows, quote, through the years, the Cuban problem was discussed in terms of, quote, dispose of Castro, remove Castro, knock off Castro, etc. And this meant the overthrow of the communist government in Cuba and the replacing of it with a democratic regime. Terms such as the above appear in many working papers, memoranda for the record, etc. And as stated, all refer to a change in the Cuban government. All right, so we have an asterisk here. Uh, Senator Mathias says, let me draw an example from history. When Thomas A. Beckett was proving to be an annoyance as Castro, the king said, who will rid me of this turbulent priest? He didn't say go out and murder him. He said, who will rid me of this man and let it go at that? Mr. Helms then said, that is a warming reference to the problem. And Senator Mathias says, you feel that spans the generations and centuries? He says, I think it does, sir. Senator Mathias says, and that is typical of the kind of thing which might be said, which might be taken by the, uh, and it cuts off there, but I'm assuming he's talking about the administration. Helms, who had considerable experience as a covert operator, gave precisely the opposite meaning to the same words, interpreting them as coveying authority for assassination. Helms repeatedly testified that he felt that explicit authorization was unnecessary for the assassination of Castro in the early 60s, but he said that he did not construe the intense pressure from President Nixon in 1970 as providing authority to assassinate anyone. As Helms testified, the difference was not that the pressure to prevent Allende from assuming office was any less than the pressure to remove the Castro regime, but rather that I had already made up my mind when uh, we weren't going to have any of that business when I was director. Certain CIA contemporaries of Helms who were subjected to similar pressures in the Castro case rejected the thesis that implicit authorization to assassinate Castro derived from the strong language of the policymakers. Bissell testified that he had believed that, quote, formal and explicit approval would be required for assassination, and McManus testified that, quote, it never occurred to me that the vigorous words of the Eternal Attorney General could be taken as authorizing assassination. The differing perceptions may have resulted from their different backgrounds and training. Neither Bissell, an academic, an academic whose agency career 
for six years before he became DDP, uh, had been in the field of technology. Norm McManus, who had concentrated on intelligence and staff work, were experienced uh, as covert operation as covert operators. The perception of certain agency officials that assassination was within the range of permissible activity was reinforced by the continuing approval of violent covert actions against Cuba that were sanctioned at the presidential level and by the failure of the successive administrations to make clear that assassination was not permissible. This point is one of the subjects considered in the next section. All right, in section four, the failure in communication between agency officials in charge of assassination operations and their superiors. All right, so it looks like we've got about 30-something pages to go. And so this is looking like a pretty good spot to cut off for the day. And this we will definitely wrap up tomorrow. And uh, at the end of this, uh, I'm going to find some other ZR Rifle documents that talk more about QJ Wynn and Hitman Max and stuff like that. So, But uh, thanks for tuning in, everybody. We'll be back tomorrow.